get the bracket. <laughs> So welcome everyone to the CGPP seminar today. Before we start, uh, I would like to ask our online guests to mute themselves. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we gather and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Today, it's my extraordinary pleasure to welcome Professor Cherry and George as our speaker on what 21st century censorship tells us about democracy and despotism. Cherry and George is a professor of media studies at Hong Kong Baptist University, where he also serves as associate dean for research and development at the School of Communication. He researches media freedom, censorship, and hate propaganda. And among his long list of works, his book, Red Lines, Political Cartoons, and the Struggle Against Censorship on MIT Press last year, was honored by the Association of American Publishers as one of the year's three top scholarly books in both the media and cultural studies and in the graphic nonfiction categories. He's also the author of Hate Spin, The Manufacture of Religious Offense and Its Threat to Democracy, also on MIT Press. But once upon a time, uh, before joining academia and before getting a PhD in communication from Stanford, Professor George was a journalist for the Singapore newspaper, The Straits Times. And I first came across his work focusing on media and politics in Singapore and Southeast Asia through his best-selling book, Singapore, the Air Conditioned Nation, which the economists described as the best introduction to Singapore's idiosyncratic political system. Uh, but I have to say, I was most impressed um, by your description on your alternative CV on your website that you hold the world record in writing the most books about Singapore politics and media that make no difference whatsoever to Singapore <laughs> politics and media. So let me now invite Professor Cherry and George to speak for about 35 minutes on the topic, mm -hmm. what first century censorship tells us about democracy and despotism. Then I'll open it up for Q&A. Carrying the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Max, and for your speech for all this uh, very, very kind uh, invitation. It's a, a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially physically, uh, rather than uh, via uh, a webinar. Um, I, uh, thank you for that, for that uh, kind introduction as well. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess that that bit in my alternative CV is meant to uh, gesture to the fact that you know I've never let um, uh, the lack of uh, policy relevance as seen by governments to be a deterrence to my own work. If it feels right, just go ahead and do it. And, you know, the people in power are not particularly impressed. That's not our job as academics to impress people in power. <laughs> At least that's the way I look at things. So I want to share with you um, uh, some thoughts on um, uh, democracy and despotism. Uh, via uh, a study of uh, censorship. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and censorship, of course, is a topic that fell off the radar for much of Western um, political science and media studies for many decades, uh, because the assumption was that uh, in the post-democratic uh, and liberal revolution, censorship is no more. Uh, but that, of course, was based on the uh, simplistic notion that uh, censorship is largely direct, coercive, and um, comes from states. Whereas, of course, now we know that censorship can come from many different directions, not just the state, and uh, can take many forms, including uh, you know, fairly insidious, uh, subtle forms that are not easily recognized. Um, and there's a lot been happening in the last um, uh, couple of decades uh, that I think warrant uh, you know, revisiting this very old topic of censorship. And I, uh, what I did, uh, what I've been doing in the last few years is to try and bring together uh, this uh, wisdom from different fields about uh, modern censorship, as well as some of my own research, and, um, and try this rather ambitious exercise of mapping the, uh, the state of global uh, censorship. Uh, and uh, to, to do this, what I um, embarked on 
um, a few years ago was this project that looked at the state of censorship around the world as experienced by political cartoons. So this is not primarily about political cartoons uh, that happens to look at censorship. It's a book about censorship that happens to uh, focus on the experience of political cartoons. Uh, I interviewed about uh, 60 cartoonists from all five continents um, uh, to get a, get a sense of the range of um, modalities and motivations of modern day censors. Open, liberal democracies, uh, closed autocracies, and a vast number of hybrid regimes in between. Um, the, uh, it, it is, uh, the book appears entirely in graphic form. So I collaborated with, uh, uh, with a Singaporean comic book artist, Sunny Liu. Uh, and on the right of the screen, you see just a couple of uh, sample pages. So that's how it appears. Uh, like interviews with cartoonists appear as comics. And of course, the great merit of this approach is that I get to show a lot of, of cartoons as well, but also explain concepts in graphic form, which I think uh, uh, you know, has been extremely useful. Um, when I, talk, I mentioned how the landscape has changed uh, in a modern day censorship. And you know, if, if you've been following um, uh, think tanks as well as uh, other research institutes look at modern day autocracy. You would have noticed that uh, this has been on their radar too, right? So uh, on the left is a report from five years ago from Freedom House, uh, recognizing that modern authoritarians have shifted in their methods of, um, uh, of control, uh, often using more subtle means, uh, Often using market means in terms of uh, media capture, uh, finding insidious ways to uh, to uh, take over the media without necessarily nationalizing it. Just kind of the old-fashioned communist view, right? The communists thought that in order to control the media, you need to own the media uh, directly. Uh, Modern-day authoritarians, no, they don't. They, no, they don't have. To. There are many ways that you can co-opt. Uh, big media, private media, <laughs> without actually having a over relationship. Uh, this year's uh, BDEM uh, report uh, has the heading auto authorization changing nature. Uh, and one of the changes they've identified is that it's would be not new to any of you, uh, would be the, um, uh, the extent of uh, polarization, including toxic polarization that has gripped many, many people. Um, so, so that's the kind of changes that we have seen in the uh, political landscape um, in, in recent years. Well, actually, it goes back more than a few recent years, but I think it's been uh, recognized in the last uh, five years or so as, as worthy of, of study. Uh, but I think, you know, when you think about censorship, I think most of us are still gripped by uh, this, this Orwellian vision. Uh, think about how influential the, uh, the metaphors, the language of uh, 1984 still are, yeah. um, and how much that still influences the way we think about censorship and control. Uh, what, what, what was the vision that uh, George Orwell presented? I think this is a scene from um, 1984, the movie, uh, and you have uh, Winston Smith being tortured. Uh, by his tormentor, who was trying to force him to acknowledge that the four fingers that he that he shows may not be four, two, three, whatever. So whatever the censor says, uh, it's an extreme totalitarian view of censorship that uh, that says that you know the, our job is to tell you that black is white, um, that thought can be a crime, can stop crime, so on. It's about total control. And that term Orwellian uh, still um, has a very strong hold in our imagination when we think about uh, how autocracies operate. Total control of um, controlling your thoughts, uh, strongly ideological, uh, brooking no dissent, and so on. Yeah. Uh, well, the truth is that there are no states, except maybe a couple of exceptions, that actually do operate that way. Yeah. Uh, we now know that. Uh, uh, looking back at you know, even the Soviet Union, uh, uh, China stopped behaving like that decades ago. 
Okay. So I think if we don't acknowledge that, then we're missing uh, what's actually happening on the ground in autocracies. And more seriously, I think we may be guilty of underestimating how sophisticated and resilient modern day autocrats are. Yeah. So part of what I want to do in the book is to look at the uh, the sheer range of uh, of autocratic styles. And, and this, you know, if you go back to uh, older writings, this is not new to close watches of authoritarian regimes. So you have uh, Hannah Arendt, for example, pointing out based on her uh, study of, of um, uh, immediate post-war period and so on, that uh, she, she points out in the book on violence, um, never assume that violence is power. Uh, yes, uh, um, violence can be a means of attaining power, but it is never a means of securing power. Uh, the quote, which I uh, use in my book from Mao Zedong, the famous quote, uh, oh, power flows from the barrel of the gun. Uh, again, tries to capture for us that oh, it's power equals violence. But uh, the rest of what he said is often not quoted. And what he actually, the full quote actually says that power flows from the barrel of the gun, uh, but essentially to sustain power, you need ideology. You need your um, ideological institutions to keep you in power. The gun brings you to power, it doesn't sustain it. Um, so that being the case, uh, well, does that mean that, uh, well, let me give you one more example of a writer sensitive to this. Um, uh, Miklos Harajdi, right in Hungary, uh, a writer and artist and organizer, uh, writing during what he himself called the um, the uh, mature socialism. I think he called it uh, the mature, no, the mature one-party state. He contrasts the early Stalinist period as paranoid, hard military life requiring complete consensus and loud loyalty. Uh, neutrality is treason, ambiguity is betrayal. In that context, there's no such thing as neutral art, and this will be familiar to those of you who studied the Cultural Revolution in China as well. Uh, you know, no such thing as neutral entertainment. You are either um, uh, pro-revolution in terms of being pro communist party, or you are treasonous anti-national uh, reactionary. So even art is forced into a propaganda. Very well then. But uh, Harashi points out that that is no longer, was no longer the case in Eastern Europe that he knew. Uh, that uh, post Stalinist regimes were more confident, therefore softer, they expanded the boundaries of the permissible. Uh, so instead of daily directives, what you must say, what you cannot say, there's actually quite a bit of reading. Uh, I, know, I know that you have uh, Jennifer Khan uh, scheduled to speak here uh, sometime this, this term. and. Of course, she and her collaborators have been at the forefront of um, exploring this in the context of China, uh, the, you know, uh, getting rid of this uh, old stereotype that China is all about absolute control. The party would not have lasted if it was about absolute control of all politics <laughs> and speech and action. Um, of course, we, we, I mean, we still do see uh, examples of uh, brutal uh, conduct by authoritarian regimes. So, so one artist that I feature in the book is uh, Ali Prasad um, from Syria. Uh, he drew this kind of cartoon um, about uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, one day he's uh, picked up in an unmarked car um, and his assailants break his hands and throw him back silent. So this is him in hospital with broken hands. And it's not, uh, not exactly a very uh, nuanced way of dealing with this, with your ideological opponents. And there have been cartoonists, uh, notably in Sri Lanka, for example, where they killed for that. <coughs> uh, so, so very brutal um, uh, reprisals do happen. But I would argue that this is not actually uh, routine. And we're missing a lot of the uh, picture that we think that this is essentially how uh, resilient of authoritarian regimes stay in power. Um, so I argue that, in fact, uh, regimes uh, calibrate the, uh, the controls they use on at least uh, these three different dimensions. 
uh, they, they can decide whether to use extreme or light violence. They can decide whether to use uh, spectacular or stealthy um, punishment and reprisals. And they can, they can decide whether to use narrow or total approaches. Um, and uh, my argument is that uh, the uh, resilient, stable autocracies in general limit the use of extreme violence, um, try to use as much uh, sort of co-optation, economic carrots and so on as possible, uh, so that a lot of the uh, interventions are not even felt as censorship. They, um, they try to use more stealthy methods rather than highly visible methods. And again, I don't want to uh, overstate this. There are occasions when uh, autocrats want to make the point that they are still in power and will identify a target uh, for spectacular punishment, just to remind people of this boss. But then again, that's not routine. Uh, they would much rather most of the time deal more stealthy. One of the stealthy ways of censorship, um, primarily economic, you buy over, uh, you know, you put cronies in charge of media businesses uh, and so on. So they know what the right thing to do is, uh, even though there are no visible instructions sent to them. Uh, or one uh, more recent form of stealthy censorship is algorithmic censorship. Uh, and of course, people don't, the best of times, people don't understand how the internet works. So if you can work with internet companies, if you can work with internet platforms, uh, you can influence messengers <laughs> without anyone uh, having a clue of what's actually going on. So extremely uh, uh, under the radar. And, and finally, and I think this again is underappreciated, uh, um, most authoritarian regimes will uh, opt for narrow targeted censorship rather than uh, total. Uh, so there's a lot of comparison between uh, uh, Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong uh, now, but you know, there's not, nothing in today's China approximates the, the kind of total vision that was apparent in the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. Um, so you have, uh, for example, um, but the, uh, most of the entertainment industry does not have to conform with uh, communist ideology most of the time. Yeah. Um, there are other ways, interesting ways in which even news is subject to more targeted control rather than uh, total control. Um, and this is common throughout most uh, 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 most autocracies. Um, uh, the, uh, to give you a couple of examples, uh, in most autocracies, including Malaysia, Singapore, China, uh, and elsewhere, the uh, governments would be far more sensitive to what comes out from free-to-air TV than on niche media like the internet or um, uh, print publications. Because free-to-air TV tends to be the most influential among voters. Yeah. Uh, so there are different censorship standards. So, so uh, what uh, appears on CCTV's evening news is more regulated than what appears in a business publication like uh, Chai Sun in China. And same thing is true in Malaysia, where you have, um, and Singapore, but we use Singapore as a Singaporean, so let me give you a Singaporean example. Uh, you, if you subscribe to a cable service in Singapore or streaming services, it's indistinguishable in most part from what you would get in a freer country like Australia. You get all channels you possibly need, right? Uh, but who provides local news on TV? It's a complete government monopoly. The only government, the only uh, TV news station in Singapore is 100% government. Yeah. Uh, so a, a, a classic case, not unusual, of very targeted censorship. Uh, you give people all the entertainment they possibly want. Uh, you don't particularly care whether the values presented in, in that entertainment conform to your purest visions of what your society should be, but you yeah, have absolute control over TV news. So that's an example of uh, uh, narrow censorship. Um,
let me uh, segue into a very brief um, definition of censorship, which I think will help um, make clear what the um, different variations are. We think about a simple model of censorship, that you could define it as uh, an intervention with power between communication or in communication between willing senators and willing receivers. So we have to review this in clear um, But the variations on this, which would include uh, self censorship, uh, which is essentially the application of power uh, on the sender, such that the sender is no longer willing to send it. So you don't actually need to intervene with a message, you intervene uh, um, via coercion or the threat of coercion, uh, making people reluctant to actually say something in the first place. Uh, there's also market censorship, which is uh, extremely important. It's very, very, uh, it's a universal form of censorship that happens in people democracies as well, uh, which is um, the application of financial power at various levels. This could apply to the influence of investors, or buyer investors, advertisers, distributors, customers, and it can hit um, the uh, publisher, the editor, the media organization, or the individual. Uh, these are all graphics taken from my book. Um, but let me, uh, so, so I've argued so far that. Um, That uh, to understand modern censorship and democracy, and I have to um, appreciate the fact that most try to be narrow, invisible, and so on. And the reasons for this, I guess, would be obvious to uh, the all scientists uh, in this room. That by and large, uh, you know, we know that uh, under literature that says that you know that, that uh, the, the use of coercion and violence uh, can backfire on whoever's using it. And that's clear enough to apocalypses. They've learned it from experience, even if they don't actually read uh, you know, journal articles by political scientists, that it might be a mistake to over <coughs> And hence, I think, this shift uh, to, uh, uh, to more calibrated forms of repression. But there is a counter trend that is apparent, I think, in uh, uh, including the democracy, <coughs> which is the trend towards actually more visibility. Uh, and here, what I'm uh, gesturing at would be things like in the, here, even in Australia, like uh, very uh, protests, uh, demonstrations of outrage um, that translate into campaigns for deplatforming, cancelling, and so on. Uh, there's, a, in, there's, in fact, no week goes by in the world um, where there isn't some controversy over some form of expression that uh, people are protesting loud and shouldn't be taken. The most recent extreme one, of course, was three weeks ago when someone was being stabbed. So it happens in all kinds of contexts. What's, what's actually going on there? Uh, so I want to end with um, some thoughts on what I call uh, performative censorship. How we define it? Oh, we have two minutes. Okay, it's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Oh, I'll just take another 10 minutes. Um, so what I'm toying with is this idea that not just censorship, but any uh, dispute over restrictions of any kind, I'm focusing on censorship, uh, a dispute between group X and group Y, you could find that uh, these groups engaged in combat over something like whether um, <clears throat> the, the big ones would be whether it's okay to show images of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, it could be in the past debates over pornography. Uh, it could be uh, debates about the use of certain words. It could be the debates over in the US, the use of the Confederate flags. Uh, in many countries, including Australia, debates over a statue. You know, whether a statue of some colonial figure should be taken down or not. Um, I think if you want to understand uh, why some of these debates are so intractable, uh, it, it is useful to ask what 
what's the agenda of the Greek sect thing? And I'd argue that um, the, the contestants' agendas could be described as either instrumental or principal. Instrumental. Let me give you an example of a purely instrumental dispute over symbols and why this is so easy to solve. A purely instrumental dispute over symbols would be like the location of traffic signals. Yeah. Uh, you are living on the street. Should there be a new pedestrian light? Uh, what should be the speed limit? Uh, how long should the green light be on for? How, uh, how frequently should the red light come on? Yeah. Uh, in practically every case I know, such disputes, uh, and maybe that's changing in the culture wars, but such disputes are purely instrumental. Um, uh, pedestrians want longer red lights so they can cross the street. Um, uh, drivers want longer green lights so they are free for the traffic. Yeah. Uh, and democracy, of course, has um, well established ways to solve these disputes. Uh, let's get the evidence, let's study the street, let's listen to the different lobbies. How many, how many voters are pedestrians? How many voters are so cyclists now in Australia? That's a big thing, right? Uh, how, how many voters are drivers? And let's uh, adjust to your, um, your red light, green light timings accordingly. Not complicated because both sides have purely instrumental goals. But what if one side's goals are more principled rather than instrumental? What if what they seem to be asking for is not actually the point. Uh, so research going back uh, several decades to disputes in the US over uh, prohibition, for example, and then pornography, uh, suggests that many of these disputes are actually symbolic. Uh, they've been described as symbolic crusades, uh, where, for example, uh, uh, pro-temperance lobby, anti-alcohol lobby, actually, frankly, is not that bothered about who's drinking and who's not drinking. Alcohol becomes a symbolic dispute uh, for a particular group to, um, to advertise its values. A group that feels that it's been too marginalized, it's been too ignored, uh, sees um, a core celeb um, over which it can state its values, make its values heard, uh, make policymakers take them more seriously. That's really what they want. It's, uh, it's more about principle, less about uh, instrumentality. Uh, and uh, authors who came up with this idea of symbolic uh, crusades came to this conclusion because what they found was that once this battle had been resolved in one way or another, once pornography had been banned or once alcohol had been banned, for some reason, the groups that had been pushing very, very hard for these bans were not at all interested in enforcing. So everyone knew, for example, that yeah, if you ban alcohol, but anyone who wanted alcohol could still get it. Everyone knew that if you ban pornography, but anyone who wanted pornography could still get it. And so this was observed in the US uh, in, uh, more than 50 years ago. It's routine in more controlled societies today. Like, uh, for example, the modern equivalent of it was that it would be that, say, in Pakistan, there's a national ban on alcohol. But everybody knows you can drink alcohol. It is said to do it at home and hotels and so on. And so, so why is it that the groups, the lobbies that were that were that treated as uh, uh, that, that expressed such intolerance over the sin of drinking alcohol, uh, were were willing to tolerate the fact that in fact there was still alcohol in the industry? It's because their goals were not in fact instrumental. It's because their goals were not actually to stop everyone from drinking alcohol. Their goal in, um, was simply to uh, state that uh, they are from a community whose values must be taken seriously. It's about being taken seriously. Uh, I mentioned the Prophet Muhammad uh, cartoons, and Salman Rushdie is another important, interesting case. You would think that uh, the goal there is to seriously ban this word, satanic verses, if you understand that. I've asked uh, friends in Pakistan, um, as well as India. India, by the way, was the first country to ban synthetic verses. I've asked friends in India, uh, well, the ban still exists. Is it possible to order synthetic verses online? Yeah. 
and then they, they went through the process, they showed me the screen grabs, you can order it online. Uh, is it because India and Pakistan or Indonesia don't know about the internet? Is it, is it because religious conservatives uh, don't know about the solution? Well, of course not. Right? But as these uh, scholars uh, uh, 50 years ago realized, uh, you know, enforcement was never the, the issue. Right? The issue was uh, stating their values. Uh, so, so I've come to the conclusion that uh, you can map various censorship disputes on, on this grid that uh, the easiest to solve, like I said, was where, is where both groups are instrumental in their, uh, in their goals. Uh, if one side is instrumental and one side is principal, that's also okay. So this would be, uh, this would be the case of both our call and pornography. Uh, because, and I say that uh, uh, those who want to drink and those who want to consume pornography are generally more instrumental than, than principal. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the consumer of pornography, for example, does not consider it a major concession uh, if the local regulator says that, well, you can have your pornography, but it needs to be wrapped in your porno magazine, but it needs to be wrapped in brown paper. Uh, or you need to ask uh, the vendor for it and somebody openly explain. But the consumers of pornography don't say, well, well this is a violation of my, my rights. You know, I, I need to have it displayed. Yeah, they say, oh, yeah, okay. give that concession to the conservatives. In contrast, something like statute disputes are in what I call the zone of zero sum contention. Um, and the Confederate flag dispute as well. Both sides see this as a uh, symbolic battle. Yeah. Um, if one side was more instrumental about it, it would be easier to solve. Because, for example, uh, there have been attempts to deal with statute dispute by saying that, well, okay, let's let's leave the statute there, but let's uh, put uh, let's change the plaque, right? Uh, let's uh, make sure that any visitor to that statue uh, reads a disclaimer. That this guy was once regarded as a hero, but he had a bunch of things he did. That would work if the anti statute people were more instrumental. But if both sides uh, see the alternative position as intolerable and slight on their own uh, position, their own status, then you end up with uh, um, a state of affairs that neither is willing to give it, uh, they, they lose too much of it. Um, so that's where I am in thinking about that. I have no idea, frankly, how to solve this issue of zero sum contention, where both sides are equally committed to some, uh, to, you know, to either side of the symbolic dispute. Um, <laughs> I would just say that I would interpret the proliferation of such disputes as a symptom of an increasingly polarized world and, and culture more similar in, in many ways. Thanks so much. Uh, for laying all of that out and um, giving us a lot to unpack. I want to jump right in and ask uh, people in the room to